Whenever there's a murder, it's the job of detectives to find out who the killer is and how they killed. And often, it's forensic evidence which provides the clues. The finding of his DNA wasn't just on the murder weapon, it was on a most important part of the murder weapon. This evidence was the breakthrough that we needed. The forensic evidence in this case was crucial. In this series, we shine a light on how cutting-edge forensic techniques and the power of science brought the most dangerous killers to justice. A truly horrific criminal, a monster. It's a hammer blow. You don't know how you're going to carry on. We'll hear how some of the most disturbing crimes were solved thanks to the tiniest fragments of evidence. He basically said to me, she's in the house, go and find her. The amount of blood that was there indicated that there was a, a frenzied attack. There was no reasonable explanation for them. That's why he changed his plea. And how even the most forensically aware of killers couldn't beat the experts and hide their crimes. The key thing about having a DNA profile is you've got probably the sharpest tool in the box. I was so elated beforehand. We didn't have the evidence and all of a sudden we'd cracked it. In this episode, a young girl is reported missing. As time went on and police made renewed appeals for information, it became a bigger story. A community and a family in a race against time to find her. I was very scared of her. When she's missing, you don't know if she's being held against her will. A search that starts with a whole area but whittles down to one small space. Clearly what I'm now going to have to do is go out into the loft on my hands and knees, uh, on the joists. And the most damning evidence of all. We found uh, a memory card. This memory card, it's still one of the best finds I've ever seen. This is Forensics, Catching the Killer. routine to go to the house where the child was last seen. Just have a, a quick look around to make sure there are no obvious signs of any crime having taken place. Or indeed, the child is not just hiding and any of someone has overreacted or parent has overreacted because they can't find her. There may have been a, a dispute within the family and someone has taken himself off to a quiet corner or hidden in the garden and refused to come when called. And people may think she's missing when in fact she's not. On the 3rd of August 2012, a family in New Addington, South London, had reported their little girl missing. Tia Sharp was just 12 years old. Detective Chief Inspector Nick Scola was one of the Metropolitan Police's top homicide detectives at the time. He, like the whole force, was experiencing a particular set of challenges that summer. 2012 was an incredibly busy period in London. The Olympics were on as a massive policing commitment. On top of that, um, there was civil disorder and looting of shops as well. So all round resources were stretched. And in fact, other forces offered the Met police mutual aid and they came in to help police the Olympics. Tia's family said they'd last seen her that day when she left her grandmother's house to go shopping in nearby Croydon. Her father, Steve, who was estranged from her mother, was living in Northampton. I got a phone call from Tia's uncle at the time, and he said to me, he said, I don't want to alarm you, but Tia's gone missing. She'd never run away from home like that. It was definitely out of the blue for Tia. It was not in her character to do that. The family initially told us um, that Tia had left to go to Croydon on her own to buy some flip-flops. 
We were told she spent the night at the house before going. Tia's disappearance quickly moved from a local to an international news story. I was in the office um, when the news dropped that the police were making appeals for any information about a girl who had gone missing. Martin Brunt was crime correspondent for Sky News at the time. Of course, most girls who go missing turn up within a few hours quite safely. Uh, but as time went on and police made renewed appeals for information, uh, it became a bigger story. The first interview I did with a family member was with Christine, Tia's grandmother, and she was full of concern. Uh, at that stage, she simply wanted to get a message to Tia that if something had upset her, if there was something um, wrong in her life that they didn't know about, um, her grandmother wanted to make it clear that she wasn't in trouble. And wherever she was, she should call a member of the family and let them know that she was safe and that she should come home as soon as she could. And she wasn't going to get told off for having disappeared. Tia's father, Steve, had made his way from Northampton to South London. I went straight to the New Adderton Police Station. I met a lot of friends that I knew growing up there. But I also see Tia's mum there and Tia's uncle. And a few friends were there and we stayed there for about an hour. And then we went up to Tia's nan's house. And a few people went into the house. Myself and my dad were at the front of the house. And then that's when Stuart Hazel came out. He walked up to me, put his hand on my shoulder, said, don't worry, we'll find her. It wasn't until later on the Sunday morning when we had the opportunity to interview the family that it was established that Christine was Tia's grandmother, but that Stuart Hazel was Christine's partner. While local people, friends and neighbours began to scour the area for Tia, Steve started his own private hunt for his daughter. I went down to the local petrol station, got myself a coffee and an opportunity to search, and I, and I ended up searching all through the night. I went through the golf courses, through the woods, scared of for TR and obviously what possibly I might find. I was very scared for her because you when she's missing you don't know if she's being held against her will. You don't know yeah if she if she's been locked up or if she's hurt, can't make her way home. When you're walking around and you, you're you looking and you're shouting out her name and obviously you, you want to find her but then you're concerned of how you'll find her and what, what, what the situation will be if you did find her. In August 2012, police in New Addington, South London, were searching for a 12-year-old girl who had been reported missing one Friday night. According to her family, Tia Sharp had left her grandmother's house earlier that afternoon to go shopping, and she hadn't been seen since. A little girl with a big personality, Tia was well-known and well-liked. Tia was a very bubbly little girl. Um, she had a broad London accent, so she'd go into a room and you, you'd certainly know that she was in the room, so she'd stand out a lot. But yeah, 
is a beautiful little girl. The neighbours who knew Tia uh, told us that she was a very sweet kid. Uh, we got the impression, talking from those who knew her, that uh, she was quite young for her age. She was 12. Um, although others told us that she was quite savvy, um, she didn't live on the estate. She was simply staying there with her grandmother and her grandmother's boyfriend. She was a, a memorable um, character on the estate, the regular visitor to her grandmother's house. It was those neighbours who knew the area best who assisted DCI Nick Scola and his team in searching it. It's a large estate, working class, quite condensed with small gardens, but a tight-knit community, um, as evidenced by the fact of how much they wanted to help when Tia went missing. Tia's family also wanted to help, asking everyone they could if they had seen their little girl. Had they seen a description of what she was wearing, putting flyers out, sticking them to lampposts, trees. So we were just walking around, handing them out, asking people if they knew anything, any information. In addition, the physical searches on foot were continuing and growing. Andrew Langley was a crime scene manager working for the Metropolitan Police at the time. The family and the local community were organising searches. Uh, they were searching uh, garages, open spaces. The area is surrounded by, by woodland uh, and, and open land, uh, and that was all being searched um, by the families and the, and, the, and the community. As the searches continued, DCI Nick Scola and his team also pursued other lines of inquiry. The estate is a very self-contained estate with countryside on three sides, which very much assisted the investigation strategy in being able to check the transport routes in and out of the estate. There were searches being made of CCTV, um, which meant that uh, not only did we have to look at the CCTV um, around the Addington area, but we also had to look at Croydon and all the transport methods getting between the two. Tia would have had to travel by bus and then most likely tram to get to Croydon. It was too far to, for her to walk. So CCTV would have corroborated the account she'd left to go to the shops. The trawl for video evidence of the little girl did show her and her grandmother's partner, but on the day before she went missing. We have CCTV of Hazel and Tia buying some sweets and some foodstuffs, and then CCTV on the bus journey from Forestdale up to the estate on New Addington where they lived. So we knew it was possible and very likely we would have seen her had she done that journey in reverse the following day. We had Hazel's account of Tia leaving to go to Croydon. And the next door neighbor of the grandparents also said he had seen Tia leave at about the same time that Hazel said he saw her leave. But there was no evidence from any buses or any trams that she would have had to use to get to Croydon. Of her, there were no bus drivers or tram drivers who remembered uh, a girl fitting her description getting on any of those vehicles. Uh, nobody had offered any potential sighting of her, as far as we knew. Having been the last person to have seen Tia before she disappeared and telling police where she was headed, most of the leads had come from Stuart Hazel, but some of them didn't stack up. One of the strange aspects of Hazel's account that Tia was going to Croydon to meet a friend while she was shopping but that she'd left her mobile phone behind. He stated it was because she'd been playing on it so much the battery was flat and she'd left it charging. But in this era, uh, young people don't leave their mobile phones behind. It'd be very unusual. And likewise, when we were younger, we'd arrange to meet someone outside of certain premises or at a certain time, but I don't know 
youngsters these days have that skill set. They would simply stay in touch by phone and arrange that meeting spot. The police continued to make appeals for information about Tier three, four days in. Privately, they were telling us that they were very, very concerned uh, about her safety. Uh, I think the clear indication for those of us who cover stories of missing children, um, it became clear that they felt um, already by then that there were things that didn't add up. As the investigation continued, it turned out that although I was told that she spent the night with her grandparents, in truth, Christine worked in a care home, although she'd been due to come home at 10 o'clock on the Friday night, due to staff shortages, she'd been asked to do a night duty, stayed on overnight. So Tia's night was spent alone in the house with Hazel. One of the early press conferences at Scotland Yard included Stuart Hazel. He made a statement but then was subject to some questioning and he made it very clear that he'd been interviewed by the police as a witness but then he went on to say that they had asked him uh, strange questions about had you done anything to tear Stuart and he said you know it was a ridiculous thing to ask me of course I hadn't I loved her I love her and uh, I, uh, I just want to know that she's safe and well and I'm doing everything else that I can to find out what's happened to her. And it wasn't only members of the press who began to doubt Stuart Hazel's motives. I remember the whispers around the community and the people that were around us at the time. Then you start to look at the way that he's having this interview, sort of press conference thing, and the way that he's talking. And you, you start to think, he's talking in pre-past tense. He's talking as if my daughter isn't even here, that she's not alive. And, and I think that, that's the point where you start, I started to realise something has gone on. A lot more than what he's made out, that she's left that house. I remember talking to my mum that evening and she said the police need to search the house. In August 2012, a little girl called Tia Sharp had been reported missing. The 12-year-old was last seen by her grandmother's partner, Stuart Hazel, at the house they shared. As soon as that report was made, police had conducted a number of searches at the property. The first search was the officer on the night he was reported missing to have a quick visual inspection. A second visit to the property the following day was again an officer acting off his own volition a sergeant, he just went around to make sure the first officer had done his job effectively. And again, it was a non-intrusive search, just to look around to make sure there were no obvious problems. But with over 30 years of experience managing complex crime scenes, Andrew Langley knew that a more thorough search was required. I was keen to find out what level of search had taken place, what did those searches comprise of? And uh, because to me that was key, were they looking for, um, for Tia or were they looking for evidence that Tia had come to harm, which isn't the same thing at all. There's a very different level of search. Um, it's a search that um, a forensic specialist would normally uh, undertake, but it's not necessarily a search that a police officer would take unless they were briefed um, to that extent. But as the senior investigating officer, the decision of when next to take the investigation rested with DCI Nick Scola. If Tia is found dead, having been taken by someone and you've wasted time searching the house, you're going to be criticised for lazy policing and wasting resources. And if you'd use those resources to look for the man who'd taken Tia, she may still be alive. Uh, and that's a, it's a, it's a difficult um, balancing act. 
But as time went on and there were no sightings of Tia, I was able to focus more on the house and go back to the family with the position that Tia may have returned to the house alone, came into the house alone with someone else who may have caused her injury. So I wished to look around that house in case that was the case. And in order to do that properly, new methods of searching the house needed to be used. As the week progressed um, and searches continued outside, one of the things that was done was that the dog uh, was put into the address to search. The body recovery dog went round the house. He couldn't go into the loft because the loft wasn't boarded and it's an unsuitable area for a dog to work in those situations. And although the dog didn't indicate anything positive, the handler afterwards analysed the dog's behaviour and said he had behaved strangely in an upstairs bedroom. Um, there was a flag hanging on the wall of that bedroom and the handler said the dog looked towards that flag. Not enough to give a positive indication, but it was unusual. Despite the body recovery dog not finding anything, crime scene manager Andrew Langley remained convinced that important evidence could be concealed within the house. I still wanted to get into that address myself. Um, I wanted to, to see for myself whether there was any indications that I thought that perhaps Tia may have come to harm. So I, I, uh, I reminded um, the, the senior investigating officer of that uh, daily um, and uh, finally, um, he agreed that, yes, that would be an appropriate thing to do. I went back to the family and said, if Tia has come back here and come to harm, there may be microscopic evidence in that room, and I needed to do a fuller forensic search of the house. That would involve many different disciplines, uh, light sources, lasers, um, chemicals, um, to, to look at every uh, eventuality. If you use some carcinogenic materials, the house has to be empty. People have to be removed from the house. It took a while to arrange that, um, find alternative accommodation for the family. So we're going back on the Friday morning with a, to do a full forensic search. But even before that search began, one of the investigative team was about to discover a shocking development at Tia's grandmother's house. The Friday morning, um, a family liaison officer went to the, to the family address. It was at that point, uh, initially, that they discovered that Stuart Hazel uh, was missing. He'd gone out early in the morning um, to a local shop but hadn't come back. Uh, which was um, concerning. So she decided that she needed to report that back to the inquiry team, and so she went upstairs because at that stage the mobile phone reception in that area was very patchy, uh, and the only place you could get a reliable signal in the house was on the landing at the top of the stairs. So she went to that location, um, and it's whilst the call was being made that she became aware of the smell of decomposition. The suspicious odour helped confirm Nick's decision that a thorough forensic search of the house was imperative. So I had two priorities then. To establish what was inevitably going to be a crime scene was properly managed, and to start a search for Hazel, because he was now a person of interest to the investigation. I became aware quite quickly of the developments in the case um, and arranged to meet with the senior investigating officer. Um, and uh, he basically said to me, uh, Andy, she's in the house, go and find her. Seven days after Tia had been reported missing, Andrew began his search of the property on the upstairs floor, where the distinct odor had been reported as being strongest. He quickly focused his attention on the loft. So once we got into the loft, or through the loft hatch, uh, I was able to assess what that space was. 
there wasn't a lot of space in the loft. It was obviously the, the same area as the house, but there wasn't a lot of height. Uh, it wasn't lit uh, and it wasn't boarded. Despite the challenges of the space, one part of it in particular drew Andrew's attention. There were a number of uh, items tucked away in the corner of the loft, most of which were covered in um, a, a sort of fine layer of dust that you'd normally expect. Uh, but there was one uh, item right in the corner of the loft that was clearly very, very clean. Clearly, I needed to go and have a look to see what that item was. The problem is, though, of course, it's not boarded. It's also August. The temperature in the loft was certainly well in excess of 100 degrees, uh, and I'm wearing the full personal protective equipment. So it's a very uncomfortable environment, and clearly what I'm now going to have to do is go out into the loft on my hands and knees uh, on the joists, trying not to fall through the ceiling. But as I approached, it was something that had been wrapped with bin bags still on a roll wrapped around it and it was a fitted uh, black bed sheet. There was a, a part of the elasticated bed sheet visible um, which I moved and uh, found a part of a, a human foot uh, clearly decomposing. Of course at this stage we don't know that that's Tia. Uh, we don't know of any other missing people but you can't make those assumptions. So at that point, um, I withdrew from the loft uh, and informed the, um, uh, the inquiry team that I had found um, some decomposing human remains in the loft. And now the terrible news had to be shared with those closest to Tia before anyone else. We were sitting there drinking a cup of coffee just updating me as to the fact that Stuart Hazelwood left and they'd found a body in the property, in the loft. And straight away you know that it's, it's Tia because there's no one else missing. And I broke down. Because I knew it was Tia at the time. Obviously he wasn't able to identify it was Tia at the time. All he was able to do was tell me that there was a body within the house. But because they hadn't found Stuart Hazel and the fact that he'd run away, I wasn't allowed to tell anyone for the rest of the day until they had found him. So he dropped me back off to my family. I think it was about four or five hours I had to sit there watching the helicopters flying over around the estate, police running around, press, knowing that it was my daughter in that house, dead. Later on that evening, I spoke to my partner. And I just sort of gave her an update to what happened. And I didn't want to have to tell her over the phone because she was so far away. And I, and I wanted to be there for her when I told her. She's on the phone. And she broke down on the phone. I said to her, you can't tell no one. This is just between me and you. With a body now found, DCI Nick Scola could focus on his other priority, to find Stuart Hazel. Through his mobile phone and travel card usage, it didn't take long. We were able to track him to London, where he stayed for a short while before getting a train down to Mitcham, where he went into an off-license, bought some vodka, and went into a local park where presumably he was going to drink it. The shopkeeper recognised him and phoned local police in a search of that area 
was started and he was found in a wooded part of that park. When he was taken back to the police station, he was found with a razor blade in his trouser pocket. The presence of the razor blade leads you to believe he may have been contemplating suicide. While detectives have been hunting down and arresting Stuart Hazel, the forensic search of Tia's grandmother's house continued. We found a number of items of interest. Uh, we found a camera um, with, uh, with no memory card in it. We found a camera. Um, and uh, later, during uh, a search, we found uh, a memory card. Um, this memory card is still one of the best finds I've ever seen. Um, if you can picture um, the inside of a cupboard under the stairs and the door frame on the inside of that cupboard with a cupboard under the stairs in a crack between the door frame and the wall on the inside of the cupboard, uh, a search officer found a memory card pushed into the crack. It was a stunning find. In August 2012, police had made the terrible discovery of the body of 12-year-old Tia Sharp in the loft of her grandmother's house, wrapped in bin liners. She had been missing for a week. The main suspect was her grandmother's partner, Stuart Hazel. But there was one more important find in the home in South London, a tiny memory card from a camera found wedged between a doorframe and a wall. That memory card was examined um, and uh, all the information on it had been deleted. But over a period of time, the vast majority of the information on that card was recovered. And the images stored on the card would shock all those who saw them. That memory card stored pictures of young girls, both Tia and her friends. It shows his clear sexual interest in girls. He stored on it images he had captured from the internet, some of which were of girls performing sexual acts who had a similar appearance to Tia. He'd filmed himself in strange sexual positions. We found video clips of Tia while she was asleep. Hayes had obviously gone into her bedroom, filmed her both close up and from a distance with his shadow looming over her the point where he was most likely standing in Tia's bedroom. We did a forensic examination of, and on the carpet, we found traces of his DNA, which we believe came from semen. I was called into the incident room, the officers dealing with it, to view what they'd found. And it was very disturbing. The video of Tia, when she was alive, just behaving like a normal 12-year-old, sitting on the settee, chatting to him, but while she was chatting away, he was filming her legs on his telephone. Things that just made you feel really uncomfortable and awkward and gave a very clear indication about what Hazel's thought processes were. But along with the videos recorded on the tiny memory card was something else, something of true horror. There are a number of still photographs uh, recovered from that card, including one of a female uh, in a sexual pose um, on Stuart Hazel's bed. It wasn't easy to establish who that photograph was of. As part of that, we took the photograph to the pathologist for him to have a look at, uh, to see if he could um, think of any way of establishing who it was. One of the things we considered was a technique called vein mapping, which has been used in, in some child abuse cases where it's possible to match uh, the lines of the, ve the veins that can be seen in the skin. But he said that, that it wasn't enough in that, but he said it was consistent with somebody of Tia's age. But he then pointed out that more than that, he said the person in this photograph is dead. He was able to do that because of something called lividity or post-mortem staining, um, which is uh, 
a technique that's been known around for a long time in that after somebody dies, the blood settles uh, due to gravity to the lowest point. Um, and it, to a certain extent, it fixes. So if you then subsequently move that person, you can see, you can see that they've been moved because the fixing is in the wrong place. Now detectives had proof that Stuart Hazel had paedophilic obsessions and that he had been with Tia's body after she had died, meaning that, quite probably, he had murdered her. But in order to secure a conviction, the homicide team needed to also prove that these images were taken by Hazel and on his camera. All digital cameras work in essentially the same way and are made up of the same components. Um, in these small pocket-sized cameras, it's quite hard to see it, but in this professional one, we can see behind the lens there is what looks like a, a green rectangle. That is actually the sensor that captures the image. But it's not a single sensor. It's a grid of millions of individual sensors. So there are subtle variations across the grid. And it's these variations that lead to a property known as photoresponse non-uniformity. In other words, across the surface of the sensor, the dots don't all respond in the same way to the same intensity of light. So what we can do is we can take test images with our camera. We can then go through the resulting image looking for the differences in how the individual cells on the sensor have responded. We'll actually take multiple images, potentially several hundred, of that perfect image to allow us to get a consistent average. And that allows us to produce something very like a fingerprint, which is unique to that sensor. There's a very high probability that those images came from that camera. What the lab did in this particular case was they didn't just use the suspect camera, they actually went out and bought more of the same type of camera and did the same mapping exercise to so the photograph. That was a way of actually providing assurance that no two cameras from the same manufacturer had the same fingerprint. And that process allowed the lab to show that, beyond reasonable doubt, the images were taken with Hazel's camera and not any other camera. Stuart Hazel's trial for the murder of Tia Sharp began on the 7th of May 2013. He pleaded not guilty and claimed her death was accidental. We had an account by this stage from Hazel that, um, that she'd fallen down the stairs um, and had presumably broken her neck and died and that he panicked. Well, we were able to at least show that there wasn't any bruising uh, in the parts of the body that you would normally expect that. And she didn't have a broken neck. So um, we were able to fairly easily discount Hazel's um, version of what had happened. But we came up with the, the most likely cause of death was, was, a, was asphyxia. Um, and the most, again, the most likely way that that happened was compression of the chest. Um, it's quite often you will find if somebody's been strangled manually, you'll find traces in the cartilages, you'll find injuries and bruising consistent that, that can show how that's happened. That wasn't there. Uh, so it's likely that uh, it was basically just a compression of the chest which stopped the tear breathing. But the turning point in the trial came with the revelation of the contents of the memory card, and in particular, the unusual step taken by the prosecution team of showing the most harrowing image on it to the open court. And the reaction around court was, was absolute horror. The prosecution said it was important uh, that the jury see this, and the pathologist evidence was that this was a photograph taken of Tia after she had died. And what it meant was that Stuart Hazel had killed Tia and then moved her body and, and then photographed it for whatever reason. Um, it showed that you know, even in her death, um, Stuart Hazel had no respect uh, for Tia. 
Little did Stuart Hazel know that in taking this monstrous image of Tia, he was creating a witness to her suffering. The problem with any murder inquiry is that really there have only ever been two people who would have known what was happening at the time of the murder. One of them can never actually tell you what happened. But when photographs are involved, when you have someone who is actually taking photographs at the time or shortly after, they're creating an additional witness. And if those images can be recovered, it goes from them presenting a reasonable defence, them having to explain the existence of these unusual images. And that, certainly in this case, was, was particularly significant because it seems there was no reasonable explanation for them whatsoever. That's why he changed his plea. Following the showing of this image, and just before he would be called for cross-examination, Stuart Hazel changed his plea to guilty and admitted the murder of Tia Sharp. And you can imagine the uproar in court, uh, the family reaction, shouts at, at him. Um, I'm sure by that stage, family members were convinced that he was guilty, but to hear him admit suddenly that he had killed Tia was, was, a, was a quite important moment of thought drama. That's when you think he's a coward. You've put us through a week of all this evidence, months of sitting there not knowing what's going to happen, as well as harming and making a search for somebody that you claim to be like a granddaughter to you, yet you, with your own hands, have murdered her and you're gonna take the coward way out and just go straight to prison and not explain to us why you've done what you've done. On the 14th of May, 2013, Stuart Hazel was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 38 years. Reflecting on this case, I think what impacted me most was the breach of that child's trust. We do have images of Tia with Hazel the day before on the bus, and she did seem to be perfectly comfortable in his presence. She seemed to like him, trust him, have no concerns about him. It was a total and complete betrayal of that child's trust. Tia's family believed that there is no justice for their daughter. True justice would mean that she had never been killed. But now their focus is the future and their promise to honor the legacy of the bubbly little girl they lost. When it first happened, it, it broke me. It broke my family. But now when I look back and reflect on it all, he's, he's taken something so precious away from me and my family. And I've had to become a stronger man for my family and take everything on my shoulders and do everything for them. I represent Tia and show the world she was a beautiful, loving daughter who deserved a lot more in life than what she got. It's not a day that goes past where I don't think of my daughter. I'll never get over what has happened to Tia. I've just got to learn to live with it. Be strong for my kids. Show them that they had a lovely big sister. Enjoy the good memories that we've got. Know that she's up there watching over them and myself. Celebrate her birthday. Whether it be letting off a balloon, lighting a candle, saying a prayer. But it's knowing that she's there again. 
really have to talk to her to give ourselves comfort that she can hear us. She's there.